Good morning and a warm welcome to Blackburn Presbyterian Church service this morning, which is coming not from the little church in Gardenia Street, but from my dining room table. It's been an unusual morning and it's been a kind of strange week, really. Um, we uh, got a text message to say that uh, there had been a power outage in Gardenia Street, that a tree had fallen on a power line and the street was blocked out. And while uh, on the ground the word seems to be that power should be back on any minute, um, the, me the message on the uh, energy company website says that it won't be till 7 o'clock tonight. So we opted for plan B, which was pull our horns in and come back to home. Unfortunately, Christine's still not home. She's out distributing uh, the, the weekly leaflet, uh, which uh, looks a bit like this this week, and which is available on the website. And also this, uh, which is her short talk, uh, and which, if she's not home in time, I may end up uh, reading to you. Uh, so we've been thinking of you and hoping that you would join us, but we didn't expect it to be quite as informal as this. So welcome to Blackburn Presbyterian Church this morning, the second Sunday in Advent, and we hope and pray that what we share together brings blessing to you and uh, to your home. Shall we, shall we begin with prayer? Let us pray. Lord God, it's been a year of ups and downs, a year of strange things, and a year in which uh, the message of the gospel has been shared in so many new and innovative ways. We thank you for that. We thank you for the opportunity to connect this way, even though we're apart. We pray that as the Premier has made new announcements here in Victoria about altered restrictions, that uh, we may yet be able to meet together before Christmas and uh, celebrate the good news of your arrival among us. Lord, hear our prayers. Bless the message of the Lord Jesus Christ wherever it's shared today, even from uh, this dining room table and into our own homes. We pray your blessing. Amen. So ordinarily I would... Uh, be playing something from Amanda. Amanda was actually going to come in person this morning and uh, I had to put her off. She uh, uh, was about to travel to church when she got the word of the blackout and the fact that we uh, wouldn't be able to stream from church. So we're uh, going to skip that uh, musical interlude which provides us with a few moments just to uh, be still and to know your presence among us. And I'm going to go on and uh, read to you uh, the passage which uh, I chose for our uh, Bible reading today. You might remember I said that in the four Sundays of Advent, we are exploring the meaning of Christmas in each of the four Gospels. Now, we notice in Matthew's Gospel, it begins with a human genealogy. And that Jesus descends from the kingly line of David, his DNA reaching back to Abraham, the father of the Hebrews. And the key word we picked up last week from Matthew's gospel was Emmanuel. Luke's gospel, as we shall see next week, sets the strange the stage with the unexpected embryos and unusual women who carry them, as uh, Dr. Rita Finger of the uh, Sojourners community describes it. Jesus begins life as a human baby. And from Matthew and Luke, we get almost all the images of our Christmas cards, um, which have started to come in. Uh, and you'll be aware that the star is mentioned in one of the Gospels and the stable and the town of Bethlehem, which features on so many cards. However, um, we will discover too that John, who doesn't mention either of these things, is a kind of philosopher and thinks about... Uh, the, the way in which what God has done through Jesus fits into our way of thinking about the whole world and he gives its profound implications. And at Mark's adult Jesus kind of bursts on the scene on the wings of the prophets that are mentioned in Mark chapter 1 
and he's identified by a messenger in the wilderness. And today we will explore that message. But here is what I've turned to uh, from Mark's gospel in order to uh, focus on the purpose of Jesus coming. And we're finding it in Mark 10. I'm reading from verse 35 to 45. Then James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came to Jesus. Teacher, they said, there is something we want you to do for us. What is it? Jesus asked them. They answered, when you sit on your throne in your kingdom, in your glorious kingdom, we want you to let us sit with you, one on the left and one on your right. Jesus said to them, you don't know what you're asking for. Can you drink the cup of suffering that I must drink? Can you be baptized in the way I must be baptized? We can, they answered. Jesus said to them, you will indeed drink the cup I must drink and be baptized in the way I must be baptized. But I do not have the right to choose who will sit at my right and my left. It is God who will give these places to those for whom he has prepared them. When the ten other disciples heard about it, they became angry with James and John. So Jesus called them all together to him and said, You know that the men who are considered rulers of the heathen have power over them, and the leaders have complete authority. This, however, is not the way it is among you. If one of you wants to be great, he must be the servant of the rest. And if one of you wants to be first, he must be the slave of all. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life to redeem many people. Amen. So I hope that God will bless us as we think about this passage of Scripture. And I'm pleased to say at this point that I don't have to read Christine's script. It's... Uh, She's just arrived home, and we'll share it with you. Apologies, Graham. Apologies, everyone. I thought I could drop off the leaflets that we normally drop off on our way to church and forgot that traffic is much, much busier than it was in COVID, in lockdown. During lockdown, there was hardly any traffic. Anyway, here I am. So, now... As you all know, this week the United Kingdom approved the Pfizer BioNTech vaccine for immediate rollout. And this was very good news for people in the UK. And I think all of us are watching and just hoping that we'll learn from what they learn with such a quick rollout. What you may not know is the background of this so-called dream team scientist couple who came up with the idea behind the vaccine. If you haven't seen them in the press in recent days, check the internet for information about them. Both scientists are the children of Turkish migrants who moved to Germany as many Turkish people did in the late 1960s. For me, they are a wonderful example of what migrants and their children can contribute to their country of choice, and in this case, to the whole world. But I want to focus now on another good news story which didn't make World Herald headlines, but was featured on ABC News last week, and actually was in the newspapers earlier, I've discovered. I think most of you know that in the 1970s, from 1972 on to 79, we lived in Armadale on the northern tablelands of New South Wales. Four of our children were born there and those were very seven very happy years. So I was delighted to learn last weekend that in late 2018, Armadale had accepted first a hundred and finally now up to I think 600 Yazidi refugees from Iraq. They did this with a lot of support, encouragement and work 
by their federal member, Barnaby Joyce. And this arrangement, two years on, is, seems by all accounts to be working well for the new migrants and the local communities. I knew very little about, little about the Yazidis and all I know now is that they are syncretic monotheists, that means people who believe in one God and draw in features from many other monotheistic religions. Their belief practices combine elements of Christianity, Judaism, Islam, Zoroastrianism and ancient Mesopotamian religions. One source said they've been around for 2,000 years before Christ. Now for the next section I'm quoting from the local paper, the Armadale Express, of August 2018. The Yazidis have been persecuted for centuries and our government, that means the Australian federal government, recognises the ongoing attempts by ISIS and others to wipe them out. So they're endeavouring to successfully create genocide. All the families have experienced, this is all the families who've come to Armadale, have experienced kidnap killings and kidnappings and other horrors. Now I realise with working at home we haven't been able to show you photos either of Armadale or of some of the refugees or of the dream team couple in Germany. But if, as you know, this um, talk of mine is available on the website or will be available on the website and you will see the photos then. So these families with this background of killings and kidnappings are naturally fearful of anyone who resembles or reminds them of the perpetrators. Some readers will have seen TV reports of Yazidis fleeing the Sinjar Mountains to escape ISIS, and I did remember. Unfortunately, hundreds were slaughtered in August 2014. So the first arrivals in Armadale came four years after that slaughter, which was on all our screens, and Australian soldiers and I think NGOs helped rescue them. They speak Kurdish Kurmanji and have no English when they first arrive. This lady, who I think may have been the mayor of Armadale, who was quoted in the Express, said that she had found all her new Yazidi friends to be gentle, polite people, eager to learn English and the Australian way of life, and of course, eager in time to find work and buy a car. And she said the children are a delight. And we have some photos of those children on the leaflet. So she said she was often asked how you can help. And then she went on to give several suggestions. And then I thought this was really interesting. Our town is the richer in so many ways for welcoming these and other needy people in one obvious way. It creates jobs. There are probably as many as 20 new jobs already and so adds to our town's wealth. And one reason the local MP was so keen to foster this was, unbeknownst to us, Armadale had hit a bit of an economic slump. Um, but it also adds, she continues, so much to the richness and understanding of us personally and as a community. So over the last two years, from what I could find out, they've become more and more integrated and this was something the local MP encouraged them to both preserve their own customs and integrate into the Australian town that had welcomed them. And at the end of these notes, I'm posting a link to an excellent article from the Australian in April this year. It gives lots of information. Now, as Christians, we know that the Old Testament has many, many references to welcoming a stranger, recognising that every one of us can be a stranger. These people did not choose to be refugees. And for that reason, we need to overcome our fear of those who live among us 
whom we do not know and whose languages we don't understand. Then, of course, there are the very well-known verses in the first book of the New Testament in Matthew. I was a stranger and you invited me in. And the disciples replied to Jesus, asked Jesus, when did we see you a stranger and invite you in? Whatever you did for one of all these brothers of mine, you did for me. And we were reminded yesterday that of course Jesus and his parents were refugees when Herod was killing the innocents, the children under two. They had to take refuge in Egypt. So who will be the strangers who cross our paths this week, next week, next year? Whoever they are, may we as individuals, as communities, as a country, welcome them as the community in Armadale welcomed its Yazidi refugees who are now their Yazidi friends. May God bless us and all refugees. Thank you, Christine. And indeed, yes, unfortunately, there are many more refugees too. Every day we're hearing about that. Well, we, we come now to uh, think about that Bible passage which I read. Um, and as uh, inevitably is the case, we, we don't have the church set up. We don't have the ability to project onto the screen behind me. And I haven't got the... So it might be a challenge here as well. Uh, we had the Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. All right, so we're looking at the uh, purpose of Jesus coming, the meaning of his, his birth. And in particular, uh, we're looking at it from Mark's Gospel. And as I read earlier, Mark chapter 10, verse 45, is the key text for us. But uh, you can sense from the argument that was going on with James and John in that passage that leadership in the kingdom that Jesus was talking about was important to the disciples. In fact, if you slip back a chapter, uh, I've called uh, my first point, James, John, and the kids. What's that all about? Well, go back to chapter nine, read there from verse 33 on, you'll discover that all the disciples were discussing who would be the, the leader, uh, who would be important, have important jobs in the, in the uh, Politburo of Jesus' kingdom. I've actually just been reading a book on Chairman Mao and the positions that people were uh, positioned in around him and by him and for him, really. So James and John they, and the disciples were interested in position. And they were embarrassed when Jesus turned and said, what, what is it you were discussing by the road? And, uh, and he illustrated what he had to say about the kingdom in a very dramatic way. He embraced a small child and put it in the middle and said, if anyone welcomes one of these children, a child like this, in my name, they welcome me. Very similar to what we discovered from Christine's reference at the end of Matthew's Gospel. Well, a chapter later, James and John are undaunted by this and they're still discussing the question of who will be at his right and left. Who will have the positions of power when the kingdom comes in? So the power struggle is rolling on. Eugene Peterson comments like this. He says, nobody aspires to be a servant. We have a higher opinion of ourselves. I thought that was very powerful. Nobody aspires to be a servant. We have a higher opinion of ourselves. So James and John were still carrying this debate forward. Of course, in the end, those who were on the right and left of Jesus were not James and John. They were criminals executed alongside him. They didn't know what they were asking for with their request. So, down is up with God. The one who is the least and the servant of all is the one who is most highly esteemed. So, and it's in verse 45 of chapter 10 that Jesus explains why Christmas happened. 
the Son of Man, he said, came. Just notice that. The Son of Man came. We don't talk about ourselves as coming. It's not the kind of vocabulary we use about our, our birth or our arrival or our growth. Uh, it, it reminded me of a, a little ditty we used to sing when we were kids. It usually followed the birthday song, you know, happy birthday to you, etc. And then when we were sm young and we thought it was pretty smart, we would say, why was she born so beautiful? Why was she born at all? Because she had no say in it. Her parents had it all. You, you may have heard that. Well, the Bible makes clear that it was exactly the other way around with Jesus. In a sense, Mary and Joseph had no say in it. They, they had the opportunity to submit and consent to it. But it wasn't their decision that it would happen. It was his intention. It was in the councils of the Trinity, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, God Almighty, seeking to redeem a people, and that God chose to send his Son, and the Son chose to go and to do the Father's will, and the Holy Spirit brings that into the lives of men and women. He came. It was all about his intention. It was his choice. This week in our own family devotions, and maybe it was last week, Nicky Gumbel made the comment, uh, the two most important days in your life are the day you were born and the day you discover why you were born. Well, Jesus knew from the start. His choice was to come and his purpose was to serve. And he expresses that reason both negatively and posit positively. He did not come to be, serve, uh, to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. Of course, many achieve uh, notoriety and fame uh, for one reason or another, whether they deserve it. But what counts with God is goodness. Uh, Mrs. Holdaway was a colleague of mine and a teacher of English of uh, some uh, renown around the school and she had a saying which I heard her say once or twice over the 30 years I was at school a man wrapped up in himself makes a very small package. A man wrapped up in himself makes a very small package. The more we think of ourselves in a way the less we are become. We're flawed. We're sinful. We saw that last week. And it was just the opposite with Jesus. He came to serve. He came, and this is my third point. Uh, the first point uh, was the uh, Peter, uh, uh, James, John, and the kids. The second one was the Christmas gift. He came. And the third point I want to make now is this, that Jesus came all wrapped up in us. In us. He wasn't wrapped up in himself. He came yeah, with those three verbs that I've mentioned, uh, which I think uh, bring uh, very clearly a little three-point sermon to us, as it were. Uh, to serve, to give, and uh, to be a ransom. So Alan Cole notes that these, these words Jesus brings together. Alan Cole was an Anglican theologian who I'm met in my early days in Armadale, actually, and I have his commentary on Mark's Gospel. And he says that with these words, uh, to serve, to give, and to redeem, uh, Jesus brings together streams of Old Testament thought from the Psalms, from Ezekiel, from Daniel, and from Isaiah. And he ties them in with this great idea of being redeemed, rescued, brought back from loss. Think, first of all, of service. There's no greater service. He came to heal, to liberate, to restore. He said in John's Gospel, I know uh, greater love than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. And for him, it wasn't just teaching. It was the defining aspect of his service for you and for me. To give. Christmas, of course, is about Jesus' birth. But the gift is the life that was lived for us, a life intentionally given for us. Some mocked and said he saved others, but he can't save himself. But saving himself wasn't his purpose. His purpose was to save us, to redeem us, to ransom us 
The word means to set free by the payment of a price. In the way in which Jesus' death achieves this, we have uh, countless volumes written. But the bottom line is that Jesus gave his life to free us from our sins for God. And that, those two ideas, being set free from something and for a purpose, uh, the great redemption of the Old Testament was the Exodus. God freed his people from slavery in Egypt, from the house of bondage. But he freed them that they might worship him, that they might discover uh, how to adore him and be his people and enjoy him forever, as the Westminster Shorter Catechism puts it. In this liberty, we can discover our purpose. That's so important. That's where our purpose is found. And many people, Jesus says, he came to redeem many people. Not everybody welcomes the service that Christmas ushers in or receives the gift Christ offers. C.S. Lewis, in his um, book, The Great Divorce, published in 1945, says this, there are only two kinds of people. Those who say to God, thy will be done. And those to whom God says, all right then, have it your way. Two kinds of people. The redemption offered is to the redeemed of the Lord. And Jesus says there are many. He is doing this for many. The prophecy in Isaiah, which talks about the servant of the Lord, uh, brings together the theme of those four servant songs. And it's clear that they shaped Jesus thinking about himself. And in early in Isaiah, we hear them, sorry, it's in chapter 51, we hear them singing the song of the redeemed. Therefore, the redeemed of the Lord shall return and come with singing unto Zion, and everlasting joy will be upon their heads, and they shall obtain gladness and joy and sorrow and mourning shall flee away. What amazing poetry in Isaiah 40 to 55, that great passage. And, and, and so Jesus is inviting us to find our purpose, our joy, our reason for being the people we are in his service. He came to serve and to give and to redeem. He did it with his life. And the song of the redeemed is precious and joyful. Let's make the song of the redeemed our song this Christmas. Amen. Now I'm going to uh, lead in our prayers of intercession. Uh, this week I've tried to tie together some of the things that have happened. And uh, so let me lead you in prayer. Our Father in heaven, we thank you for the gift of your beloved Son. It's a thing too wonderful for us to comprehend, that he could find us when we were altogether lost and ransom us from the futility of life without you and bring us into your family as adopted sisters and brothers. As you have welcomed us into your family, we too would be welcoming and hospitable. Forgive our hard hearts. We are conscious of those in need in our own community. We think of the homeless, the broken-hearted, the lonely, and all who struggle with health, especially mental health, in the aftermath of lockdown and a viral pandemic. Lord Jesus Christ, as Christmas draws near and the celebration of your birth is marked in our communities, we ask you to keep us anchored. As Son of Man, you came to serve. By your Holy Spirit, grant us to be of one mind and one heart with you. Let this be seen in the use of our time, money and energy this Christmas. In this damaged world, there are many seeking refuge from war, tyranny, injustice and cruelty. Thank you that the resettlement of the Yazidis has been so well received in the Armadale community. May we learn how to welcome and care for the widow, the orphan and the stranger. We are so grateful that the coronavirus has been well contained in Victoria and that there have been no new cases discovered in the last five weeks. 
grant that in the easing of restrictions today, the Premier will make it possible for us to gather once again. May the management of returning travellers be well conducted and protect the community. As COVID-19 continues to create illness and death, especially in the USA, India, Brazil, Russia and France, to name just the five most affected countries. We ask that wise decision-making and advice from the World Health Organization and the Center for Disease Control will arrest the increasingly rapid global spread of the pandemic. Grant that as vaccines come online, they will be highly effective and globally available. Help all nations to manage their domestic affairs in such a way as to facilitate and promote the work opportunities for their people. We ask that our leaders will find ways to develop new markets for the product, produce of the nation and that wise and sustainable industries will emerge as the closure of recent markets stimulates innovation and entrepreneurs. By your Holy Spirit, advance the ministry of the gospel to bring healing, health and purpose into the lives of every troubled family. We pray for vulnerable women and children. Grant that they will be secure and safe in the company of people who love them. These things we pray in the name of the Lord Jesus, who taught us to say together, Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. As Christmas draws nearer, every blessing to you and your home. Thank you for being with us this morning in these very different circumstances.